I'm just starting from last time what we did last time what uh, we want to do today last time we had a rather sim simple problem so we had a wire and we just guessed the current distribution over this hour wire it's the the, the fit point needs not to be symmetrical and uh, on this wire we know the current distribution i of z prime z prime means because uh, z prime is the coordinate on the of the source with the prime sign so this uh, dz prime how much does it radiate at a certain point in the far field of course uh, in the spherical coordinates here we look at the electric field radiated by this wire. Uh, the differential electric field, because we are going to integrate, of course, this thing. So this was approximately uh, 1 theta. Should be prime, but in the far field it doesn't matter, because this is amplitude. So we just neglect this prime here because uh, of the far field. Uh, then we have, of course, the phys physical factor, jkz0 over 4 pi. We have uh, uh, current i times dz prime. We have uh, the factor uh, delay divided by the distance. The distance can be just r in the far field. The small difference in the z prime are small, so uh, r is much larger than z prime, of course, in the far field. Uh, but in the numerator, in the phase, we have to consider here the whole expression uh, because phase is important. Phase is the only important thing in the far field. And we can just write sine theta here, uh, not theta prime. Okay, this could, should be theta prime. This here should be theta. But theta is good enough here, an approximation for the far field. This is what we did last time. Uh, this is what we did uh, by guessing, guessing this current distribution. We guessed it, this from the uh, from the standing wave, and standing wave is caused by the near field, uh, near field uh, of the uh, near field uh, of the currents here. Uh, we already looked at some more complicated examples. For instance, if the generator is not located exactly at the point where the antenna is. It's a symmetric, say, half-wave dipole, and we feed this dipole with a parallel transmission line. Now, uh, where's the point here? Uh, the problem is radiation from these two currents here. This radiation, if I have currents in opposite direction, they cancel out, except for this area here. So as long as this area is small compared to the wavelength, everything is okay. Uh, that's the trick why used twisted pairs. So uh, to supply a similar antenna with a twisted pair. The twisted pair. Uh, again, we put the line at right, right angle, so here. Here I have right angle, so that the radiated electric field is actually perpendicular to our line, so the line does not disturb the field. But here we have uh, these surfaces here. We have the surfaces. If these are positive, 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 positive sign, these surfaces here generate the radiation just of the opposite field. So by twisting the wires, I further reduce the radiation of a, of a line feeding the antenna. Uh, provided this was small, so this was this uh, distance here was much smaller than the wavelength. This is to keep the radiation small. And further, by twisting the wires, I further reduce this radiation. And this is the trick used in uh, Ethernet cables in uh, universe. Uh, Unshielded twisted pair cables. So UTP means unshielded twisted pair. This, this is this thing here. The, uh, we, we use this in Ethernet because we don't want our Ethernet cable to radiate anything because it's going to cause interference to radio communication. So everything here was simple. 
but now we get to this. This is also an antenna. Any kind of horn makes an antenna. It's not a particularly good antenna, but this is an idiot-proof antenna. No matter what kind of horn you make, at some frequencies, some frequency, it will work as an, a good antenna. So it's not very clever, but it's a good antenna. A good antenna also for lab because it's pretty easy to calculate how this antenna behaves. So for measurements, is okay. In the practical world, is a little bit cumbersome. We need lots of metal for, for the same amount of dB of gain here, or of directivity of this antenna. Uh, it needs lots of metal, that, that is a disadvantage. But uh, if I draw this antenna, let's analyze this antenna. Uh, so I have a piece of waveguide here. It's closed and I have a horn. If I draw just the side view here, or maybe, maybe I could draw the complete antenna here. Just to give you an example. So this is my complete antenna. So where does this antenna radiate? It certainly cannot radiate out of metal. So here on the metal surface, I have a uh, on the surface here uh, of the metal, I have E0 uh, uh, is equal to 0. E, with E0, I'm going to indicate uh, the electric field on the surface. And also the magnetic field is also 0, it's here. close to 0. So it cannot radiate out of there because there is no field. There is some field here. So uh, here E0 is different from 0 and H0 is also different from zero. I should also write the vector size. Also here the vector size. So where do we expect this antenna to radiate? We expect this antenna to radiate out of the aperture. We expect radiation coming out of here, but we not, do not expect radiation from the structure. Uh, where are the currents in such antenna? The currents in such antenna are elsewhere on the inside surface of this antenna. So there are currents in both these two planes, currents in the direction of radiation of the antenna, and there are currents to complete the waveguide field, currents flowing in the side, side uh, walls of the, uh, the, the waveguide. Not just the horn, but also the waveguide that fits. So, Currents are on the inside uh, elsewhere. So currents are maybe here. The same current flowing back here. Some currents flowing on the side walls. Uh, and the same currents I have here in the waveguide. And also currents in the walls of the waveguide. So if, we, if I were to compute the radiation of this antenna, in the same way as I did for the dipole, uh, I get into troubles. There's lots of calculation to be done. I should know all the currents in all the size of the uh, horn. Also, all the currents in the waveguide. Why? Because the waveguide, in order to operate, the waveguide is side, the side of the waveguide here should be larger than lambda half. In order for this waveguide to operate, this side should be larger than uh, lambda half. Otherwise, the, uh, the waveguide does not operate. If the sides are larger than one half of a wavelength, I can no longer say that these sides are, are smaller than the, much, much considerably smaller than the wavelength. So here, here, this was much smaller, the, the spacing of the two wires was much smaller than wavered. And I say, I can neglect that radiation. But here, I cannot say the same. Here, a waveguide, if I just truncate the waveguide here, I remove the horn. I just leave an open waveguide. An open waveguide is, is a pretty good antenna. I cannot say that I neglect the radiation out of a waveguide. It's a pretty good antenna. 
So the question is how to uh, analyze this antenna here. And that's what we are going to do today. And we are going to uh, use all the uh, three hours of our lecture today to analyze how this actual uh, uh, radiation occurs and how do we analyze such an antenna in the simplest possible way. Not in the complicated way, because we don't have time for complicated calculations. Uh, we are going to, that's what we are going to use today. The horns, we are going to analyze horns next week. Next week we have the horns, uh, but we first have to analyze, to find the way how to analyze such antennas. And uh, where is the trick here? Uh, we have to look centuries back in history to see where, when this problem, the, uh, the, the idea how to solve similar problems was solved uh, already several centuries ago. The basic idea was solved. And it happened in the Netherlands. Uh, a Dutch physicist and astronomer, a very known Dutch physicist and astronomer was Christian Huygens. What did he, he, Christian Huygens do? Christian Huygens really, want, Huygens really wanted to find out the way light propagates. He didn't know light was electromagnetic radiation, but he wanted to know, find out how light propagates. He suspected that light was waves. And the easiest way to observe waves, if you live in the Netherlands, in such a low country like, like the Netherlands, was to observe waves on the sea surface. Because uh, the Dutch are very good at building dams uh, on, on the sea surface. They even uh, uh, took out some land out of the sea just by building dams and pumping out water. So the Dutch knew, knew very well how to do these things for many centuries ago. And that's perhaps why Huygens found this out. And what did Huygens observe? If I have an obstacle in the path of the waves, so I write here an obstacle, that has a small aperture. So this aperture here is, uh, is very small. Uh, if I draw the waves with another, I want another color for the waves. Another color for the waves. Waves coming to this aperture and traveling in this direction. He observed waves on the sea surface about 250 years ago. And uh, if the aperture here in the the obstacle is very small, so d is smaller than lambda. This aperture in the obstacle behaves as a point source uh, of radiation on the other side of the ob obstacle. So on the other side of the obstacle, I get spherical waves getting out of this obstacle. So a point, uh, a small aperture behaves like a point source. Of waves. If it is small compared to the wavelength. Now, uh, what happens is the, if the aperture in the obstacle is larger? You can see that on the way, on the, uh, on sea waves, with putting larger apertures in your obstacle. If you just build one dam here and another dam here, and you leave here a larger obstacle, so this uh, larger aperture, this aperture now is D is comparable to lambda, or even larger than lambda, maybe D is also maybe larger than lambda, uh, then what happens with our waves? Our waves, again, we get here plane waves from the open sea. Yeah. 
and Christian Huygens could observe this at home. On the other side of the uh, obstacle, on the other side of the aperture, we get a number of point sources. Say if I divide this aperture in a number of point sources, and every point source, every point source radiates a spherical wave. But these spherical waves actually sum up into a wave front. But this thing is then spreading out. I'm not very good at making this drawing here, but I hope to explain you what is going on. So I have uh, very little radiation here. This is no longer a spherical wave. It's uh, an expanding fan beam on a surface or, or a conical beam in, in space. If I had three dimensions, but on, on, water, on the water surface, I can only have two dimensions. So. And uh, this will actually be such a fan in two dimensions or a cone in three dimensions of radiation getting out after be behind my behind my obstacle. So what we call this? This we call this the Huygens principle. The Huygens principle, uh, a small aperture acts as a point source and a large aperture, aperture acts as a sum of many of these small sources. What uh, some similar reasoning we already did here, but here we were dealing with currents. We, were, uh, we knew the field of a small section of wire and then we integrated, summed or integrated these, uh, these sources along the wire. We could use, do the same in this case here in our horn. But now, how to do this in uh, electromagnetics? Okay, we certainly have to need a generator here to feed our device. So the idea, now where is the idea? The idea is to wrap this uh, this uh, antenna into a surface. So wrap this into a surface, say with plastic foil, the foil that's used for storing food, for example, in the refrigerator. And now I leave the foil in place and with some acid I remove the antenna and the generator so that they, they are gone. So I'm left out uh, uh, just with the surface that was uh, enclosing this device. So uh, now I should put my sources wherever this device actually radiates. Uh, we know that this device is an obstacle for radiation uh, all over the metal surface. So uh, this metal here, I have no currents on the outside of the waveguide, so they do not radiate at all. Uh, I should also have very little currents here. There is some current wrapping around here and here. And here. This current contributes to radiation, but this radiation is very small. So I can say that uh, uh, I have no radiation here. The only radiation I have here, and here what I should do, I should pu put new sources, many small Huygens sources, that will actually recreate the field on this surface. So E0 and H0 will be recreated by these sources. The same uh, E0 and H0 I as I had before should be recreated. And these are now going to radiate. So I'm going to get radiation out of this 
sources. Many small Huygens sources. So now I should find a way how to convert this field on the aperture E0 and H0, how to make out of it sources, say Huygens sources. So these Huygens sources should replace the field on the inside. Here when I remove the antenna I have zero field inside here. Inside I have uh, not the zero, just E. Just E equal to zero and H equal to zero if I remove the antenna. If I so, uh, dissolve in acid my antenna, the antenna is no longer there, the generator is out there. So I have no field in the volume of this antenna, but I should place uh, substitution sources, replacement sources, equivalent replacement sources on the surface that's actually radiating. If we can solve this problem, uh, the analysis of such an antenna will be much, much simpler than the analysis of, uh, of all the currents we have in the real horn. Uh, in the real horn we have, okay, currents in the sides of the horn, this still play a role, but the radiation from this will go just through the waveguide, so they don't, don't really change anything and uh, they don't contribute much to the final result, though they must be there. But uh, for our calculation, this waveguide is just a complication. No matter how long is this waveguide, the result is always the same. So if I put a longer a screw here, a longer piece, piece of waveguide, and I put the same generator, I will have the same radiation out of this aperture. So if it's something uh, does not fit our reasoning, does not play a role, it's not necessary to uh, analyze it. The only import, really important thing is to find what is the field on the aperture. And find also for the aperture, the aperture can be any shape, can be a, a plane, can be a circular surface, a cylindrical surface. Well, we, we try to simplify our life, our life. So I'm always going to use here a planar aperture, like here with Huygens. Huygens also used a planar aperture because it's the easiest to calculate things. So I'm going to use simple, but uh, now I have to uh, find this replacement how to find this replacement to solve this field. Okay, so now Uh, uh, you already mm, solved a part of this problem already three years ago at the fundamentals of electrical engineering in the first year you work here at this school. And uh, if I have two separate regions with a known, known boundary between them, and I have here field H1 and here I have field H2. And if uh, these two are not identical, the geometry is indicated by the normal to this surface that's separating the two regions, normal at the right angle. Uh, where are now the currents? The currents are now here on the surface. On the surface I should have currents here. Currents can handle the discontinuity of the magnetic field. Currents flowing out. Okay. Currents, since this is a surface, I need here surface currents. So K is current. Uh, per unit width. So K has also units of amperes per meter. This is a surface current. And how do I calculate this current? 
this current k is now my normal vector product with the discontinuity of the magnetic field, so h2 minus h1. And this is what we, what you proved with elect, uh, electrical engineering, in the, the course of electrical engineering, for the tangential components of the magnetic field. The normal component has a different equation. The normal component is always continuous. The normal component of the magnetic field uh, is always continuous, except it may have a step because of different uh, permeabilities of the two media. But these uh, magnetic fields here are tangential. Tangential also here because uh, uh, if this is radiation, uh, electric field E0 and magnetic field H0 should be both orthogonal to direction to the direction of the radiation. So actually the electric and magnetic fields are both tangential. In our particular case, what do I have to do here? Uh, here I have my, my surface with the sources, my surface with the sources, and uh, I have a normal to this surface, the normal, the direction in which the wave is propagating. I have only here, I have H0, this is on the out outside, H0. I have uh, H is equal to 0 on the inside. So what is now the replacement current, the sources I need to generate this H0? I need some electric current here. I need some electric current here. Electric current K that uh, I have to draw it in this way because I need a three-dimensional drawing. So this, uh, the replacement electric current I need on this surface uh, say to replace nothing in now in the, well, my empty volume of the antenna because I removed the antenna, uh, replace, the, generate the same field on the outside, I need a replacement current. So this replacement current now, okay, is uh, the normal uh, cross product H0. I hope you understand where this comes from, and you did this already three years ago. So if I want to generate the magnetic field, uh, discontinuity of the tangential component of the magnetic field is handled by this surface current. Both, both have units amps per meter. These are amps per meter of magnetic field intensity. These are amps per meter of surface current. So this current is so many amperes per unit width of this, uh, this surface. And that's why, why the reason why it has units amps per meter. And this is fine. We can do this readily uh, with any, uh, in any case. The real problem is how to handle the discontinuity of the electric field. And that's more difficult because uh, the electric field, if I ha have here uh, E1 and here I have E2, the electric field, the tangential component of the electric field is not allowed to have any discontinuity. So I get the tangential component with the normal uh, pro uh, cross product with the normal. So E2 minus E1. To get out the tangential component, I do the cross product with the normal. This should be always equal to zero. And this is now our headache and the difficult part of uh, today's lecture. How to handle this thing? We have zero here, and this zero is defined by physics, by physical laws. I cannot overcome this. No way to do it. But uh, thinking a little bit further, 
what we actually I actually need here it's just a, a replacement source and these replacement sources uh, need not be real they may be uh, built by some imaginary components that we actually don't have in, real in the real world. And this is now difficult to imagine for many students. I will try next hour, I will try to explain how to do, 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 do this thing in the reality, in the real life. But how do we make a replacement field? Well, we have to e extend Maxwell equations with some quantities that uh, do not, uh, are not real, are not physical, but will perform this job. Will perform the jump, jump of the, the discontinuity of the electric field, the tangential component of electric field. We, may, we will make this discontinuity with now some imaginary physical quantities that actually don't play a role anywhere because we are just replacing a really existing field with some imaginary sources. We already uh, did this imagination step here. So, what is the trick? We started with Maxwell equation with the Ampere law. So, curl of H is equal to current density J plus J omega. Electric displacement, uh, curl of electric field, the Faraday law, the Ampere law, the Faraday law was minus J omega uh, magnetic field density, magnetic uh, flux density, and the divergence of the displacement was equal to rho. These Maxwell equations do this. So these Maxwell equations do not allow any, the Maxwell equations as they are written, they do not allow any discontinuity in the tangential component of the electric field. So here we're stuck. Now the idea is to extend this thing with some non-physical quantities. Uh, I will write the non-physical quantities in green here. So I put here also a current of magnetic charges and I put here a uh, density of magnetic charges. Because of this minus sign, I also have to introduce a minus here. And these are the so-called uh, extended Maxwell. What happens up here now? Uh, okay, because uh, we introduced this, this physically do not exist. Magnetic charges do not exist. Physicists are looking, f are searching for magnetic charges for more than 100 years and they didn't find, find them yet. Mathematicians say they could exist, but physicists cannot find them. So these particles do not exist, they are not there. But for our calculation purposes, we can, may use them. Because we know that they don't exist, we are just replacing a real electric field with some imaginary sources. But for our calculations, they will turn to be very useful. And what can I do with the uh, uh, magnetic charges and magnetic currents? If I have here, now when I remove the antenna on the inside of the surface, I have E0. On the outside, I have E0. How do I generate this E0, regenerate the, now the discontinuity from zero to a certain value with magnetic charges. So surface current of magnetic charges. And because of this minus sign here, I also have a minus sign here, normal vector electric field to be generated. So Magnetic charges could generate uh, uh, could generate uh, a magnetic uh, uh, discontinuity of the tangential component of the electric field. So we ca we can overcome this equation by introducing new quantities. They are not physical, but they are just a replacement. 
They, they, we do not, in reality, we do not exist. They do not exist. We just need them for our calculations to simplify our calculations. Now, how do we do these things for this problem here? Using the Huygens principle. <sighs> With the Huygens principle, the first thing is to find how an electromagnetic Huygens source looks like. So do this for the electromagnetic problems. And I have to write now down the, I have to make a drawing here to explain where do I put this source and what am I going to calculate because there's going to be lots of calculations to be done here. Uh, I have to erase the board. I have no longer any space here. We are going to use this, what I'm actually erasing right now. We are going to use this shortly. So this is not really thrown away. I'm going to use it. Next hour. This is so dirty. Especially the black is difficult to erase. So I have to define a coordinate system for this surface here and see on the coordinate system the various quantities that play a role in this problem. To replace this one, you have this in your notes, so I hope I think I can erase it just to save some space here. So I'm going to orient my coordinate system so that I have this incoming wave from the bottom, from the axis minus z. So if I draw my coordinate system here, x is z, x and y. Here from the bottom, I have an incident plane wave. So a plane wave that's coming up here and has its wave fronts infinitely wide. So this was the open sea wave Christian Huygens was observing. Okay, from the direction minus z, I can write this uh, wave. Uh, how? Uh, say this will be e zero on the aperture, e zero on the aperture as. Uh, okay, e zero. I will choose the direction one x just for our calculations, one x. Uh, some constant e zero. Uh, I could say here times a to the e to the minus j k z. This is on the bottom. I selected the direction 1x. And now in the plane x and y, I'm going to put my obstacle. x and y, I have to put a shield. And I'm going to leave just a small aperture in this shield. So a small aperture that has the dimension delta x and delta y. It's small, delta x and delta y small. And here I have the e0. e0, I draw it here, the field lines of e0. Everything else is shielded. Everything else is shielded, so my shield extends now off this surface. The shield extends. This is all shielded by my shield. It's not a particularly nice drawing, this, but hope it gives an idea. So I have only this aperture open. And what is the corresponding magnetic field? Is if this was a plane wave, of course, E times H should give 1Z the direction. So H should be in the direction 1Y. H0 here. The field on the aperture, the magnetic field, H0, should be how large is now the direction 1Y. Uh, 
uh, the amplitude of this field, if they make together with the electric field, they make a plane wave in free space. This is all free space. Also, here is free space, V0. Uh, it's just uh, E0 divided by Z0, the, by the impedance of the free space, E to the minus JKZ. Down here, down here. So below the xy plane, I have a plane wave here, a plane wave uh, falling on my screen. Uh, this is all screen with a small aperture. This is a screen with a small aperture in it uh, of the dimension delta x and delta y. Now, how about the uh, k? If I look, do the calculation here, so the normal is in which direction? The normal to this surface here, uh, the normal to this surface uh, here, for instance. Uh, no, 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 not, not to this. I, I make it unreadable. Am I drawing? The normal, I could put the normal at uh, right angle, so the normal. 1n is equal to 1z, OK? So if I calculate my uh, surface current that is going to replace this field below, if I turn off this field and I turn on the sources on this surface, where is going to be the uh, planar current, so this surface current here? This is 1z uh, dot, uh, the cross product, with h. h is 1y, the direction. Uh, e0, the constant over z0. Uh, z is, now we are uh, in the xy plane. In the xy plane, z is equal to 0, so this term vanishes. Because we are in the, in the, in the plane. In the plane, z is 0. So z is 0 here. z is 0 in the xy plane. Uh, and if I do this calculation, 1z times 1y is minus 1x. Minus 1x. Uh, what is left over? e0 over z0. What about the magnetic uh, uh, the magnetic current we need to replace the the electric field this continuity here the electric field we need to replace this electric field down here we turn off this one but we need the same on the other side so in order to turn off now this is uh, minus one z uh, times the electric field is one x times e zero so the uh, current of the magnetic charges is now becomes 1z uh, times 1x is 1y minus 1y uh, is 0. We have, I have now the replacement currents. Uh, when I have currents on this surface, and this surface is small, so delta x and delta y for a Huygens source should be much smaller than uh, delta x and delta y. And, uh, oh. Oh, I made so many mistakes, so I have to use the eraser all of the time. Sorry. So delta x and delta y are much smaller than the wavelength to be a Huygens source. To be a Huygens source. So. Uh, in this case, what can I do here, actually? Let's look first at the electric field, the electric current, what the electric current does. Uh, I have an electric current flowing on a very small surface here. Delta x and delta y are small. So this can actually behave as a current uh, segment, a short current segment. 
and we already analyzed this in the previous uh, lectures. So we know what the radiation of a short wire segment is. We know that the radiation, radiated field, I, I could write the whole field, also the near field, but we are only interested in radiation. So the radiative field, the electrical radiated field, and I will call this E1 because it's ca caused by K. Uh, I have uh, the formula, this is approximately for the radiation. Uh, one theta is the direction. Uh, I have uh, JK0, Z0 over 4 pi, this is the physical term. I have I times h, I have uh, e to the minus j k r over r, and I have a sine of theta. So this was the, uh, the thing we uh, already developed, already the first lecture we had with this course. But there is a difference, an important difference. This uh, current is not in the z-axis. This current is actually in the x-axis, okay? So we should be careful about that. So I should rotate my spherical coordinate system into uh, r, theta x, and phi x, where this rotated coordinate system has uh, the north pole in the direction of the x-axis. So I should be careful what I write here. R makes no problem, but theta is a problem. This should be theta x and uh, theta x here. Okay. Then uh, I have uh, the problem what is i and what is h. H is actually the length of my current element. The, the current is flowing in the minus, in the minus one x direction. So uh, the x length H is now becomes delta x. And what is I? We have the surface current here. It's the surface current times the width. So I is now the surface current, the magnitude of surface, times the width. The width is delta Y. And there is a minus sign because this current is really flowing in the minus 1x direction. So the radiation of this uh, surface current, we can rewrite it. Uh, as E1, because there will be also an X2 next hour for the, uh, for the magnetic current. Uh, so now E1 is equal to what? Is minus 1 theta X. I will write the sign just in front of it. Uh, okay. Constant J, K, Z, 0 over 4 pi. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, k, the absolute value is E0 over Z0, uh, times delta Y, times delta X, uh, and I just copy a, E to the minus JK R over R, sine of theta, but theta with the polar axis in the X direction, so the X. So I have to stop here because it's the end of the hour. Next hour we should continue with the magnetic current. <laughs>